So once the airway is secured, the patient has to be sedated well and put, him, put the patient on ventilator. And uh, appropriate settings on the ventilator is very, very important. The oxygen support can be initially given with 100% oxygen support and later can be tapered below 60% because oxygen also is a drug. Giving oxygen on higher concentration for prolonged duration can cause oxygen toxicity, uh, absorption atelectasis. So uh, every possible attempt should be uh, you know, instituted to avoid uh, hyperoxia to the patients. So once the airway is secured, we should switch over to breathing and ventilation. So when we are trying to assess whether the patient is breathing properly, we need to have inspection of the chest, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. So a simple clinical examination will give us a lot of clues pertaining to the findings hidden inside. Could be a tension pneumothorax, there could be a flail chest, there could be a pulmonary contusion or hemothorax or open pneumothorax. So uh, the clinical examination is uh, important and uh, your monitors can also help us to give us give a good idea about the possibility of these findings like attention pneumothorax the patient will have uh, reduced air entry on, on one side and uh, saturation is low in spite of supplementing 100 percent oxygen uh, simple needle decompression is the resuscitation measure that should be done immediately Otherwise, the patient's hemodynamic will compromise, their blood, blood pressure will remain low, organ perfusion will remain low, and then you know, they will have organ failure. So it is very important that tension pneumothorax or massive hemothorax or uh, any kind of uh, uh, injury which is life-threatening has to be addressed immediately. Uh, a flail chest or pulmonary contusion is something which is uh, which will lead to ARDS kind of a picture. The patient will remain persistently hypoxemic. Flail chest is uh, multiple fractures on the ribs on two contiguous uh, sides, and the one one segment of the uh, rib is uh, disconnected from the entire rib cage, and there will be a paradoxical movement of the uh, uh, ribs. Uh, when the patient is breathing so like if the patient is taking uh, breath inside like he's doing he's taking inspiration the flail segment will go inside okay and uh, during expiration the flail segment will come outside uh, so uh, so this poking of the ribs uh, uh, on the lungs will cause pulmonary contusion and will lead to uh, ARDS later on if the patient is massive thera hemothorax, the jugular veins will be collapsed, the patient will have hypotension, and there will be air entry reduced and uh, uh, that particular side, and there will be dullness on the percussion. Uh, it gives you a good clue that we should put an ICD. But once you get the ICD inside and we are able to see a gush of blood coming through, we should not rapidly you know, remove the you know the fluids through the drain or the blood through the drain it has to be clamped after 250 ml again okay and make sure that if the if the icd drainage is uh, more than 400 ml per hour or massive uh, hemothorax is identified it is very important that the cardiothoracic surgeon should be uh, called for and probably patient may need intervention uh, for thoracotomy and vascular uh, surgeries also may be required. Uh, if the patient has open pneumothorax, uh, three-sided three uh, 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 you know, dressing should be done where uh, the air venting is allowed uh, during expiration and during inspiration, uh, uh, the, uh, the air can come inside. So open pneumothorax, uh, if it is not, uh, the dressing is not properly a uh, three-sided dressing and one side kept open, uh, there will be accumulation of the air inside and the open pneumothorax can get converted into the tension pneumothorax. So that's why uh, these uh, situations should be addressed immediately. And if the patient is bleeding continuously, uh, it means that the circulation is compromised and we need to address circulation. We need to check the pulse first check the pulse for at least five seconds, assess for the volume and uh, rate. Uh, and if the pulse is ready and low volume, uh, two large bore IV cannulas, especially 14 to 16 gauge should be instituted because the cannulas has a shorter length and can deliver fluid rapidly. Whereas if you put central line, the length of the central line is long and the delivery of the fluids will be slow. 
so uh, uh, very important to start fluid resuscitation within first hour one liter of fluid should be given warm crystalloids should be given and if the if it is a, a child uh, then 20 ml per kg of IV fluid should be instituted immediately. So once the IV line is taken immediately, the blood sample should be sent for hemoglobin and blood grouping. Okay, these are two essential tests that should be done. Where otherwise, complete uh, blood count and uh, the routine investigation and the coagulation profile be done. But two investigations that are important is checking hemoglobin and blood group because blood group will tell you what group uh, blood uh, 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 blood transfusion should be. Uh, transfers to the patient. And uh, we should also check the uh, circulatory sign with capillary refill or skin color. So inspection of the patient uh, will give you enough clue. Patient will have mottled uh, extremities or cold clammy extremities. It, it gives you enough clue that patient has, patient has uh, lost uh, uh, blood uh, substantially and he may, he may need massive blood transfusion uh, 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 protocol. And then uh, these sometimes this bleeding can be life-threatening. Uh, so a direct compression, direct pressure on the uh, bleeding area is very, very important. Rather than just giving a dressing and leaving the dressing is not a good, good idea. So, so whenever we find that there is a bleeding which is ongoing, we need to have a direct compression with the hand. And uh, until the bleeding is controlled, uh, manually or we have interventions or surgical intervention or clamping of the bleeding area is not done, the direct compression should not be uh, relieved. And uh, so as far as the bleeding is concerned, uh, what are the areas the bleeding the bleeding can happen that we need to ascertain? There are four sides the, the bleeding can happen. The bleeding can happen in the chest, the bleeding can happen in the abdomen, there can be bleeding through the pelvis. And uh, the bleeding on the floor. So these are the telltale signs as to how much uh, bleeding the, it, uh, the patient might have had suffered from. So if the patient has pelvic injury, it is very likely that he may lose almost uh, 2.5 to 3 liters of blood uh, because the pelvic veins, the bridging veins, uh, they, they bleed continuously and pelvis is a roomy area and the, you know there, be, there is a lot of space for the uh, expansion of the bleeding. The uh, a bleed, a femur fracture can bleed around 750 to 1 liter. Whereas in abdomen, the patient can bleed like anything 2 to 2.5 liters as, as high as possible. And in the hemothorax also patient can bleed like 2 to 3 liters. So depending upon the severity of the bleeding and uh, depending upon uh, the exsanguination, uh, the shock status of the patient, the intervention should be advocated immediately. So gen naturally the patient will be in shock. The shock can be categorized as phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. If the patient has bleeding of around less than 15%, uh, is categorized as a mild bleeding ca category. Okay, we call it as a phase one or class one bleeding. Uh, if the bleeding is from 15 to 20%, uh, we call it as class two. And 20 to 30 percent, uh, we call it as class three, and uh, more than 30 percent, 30 to 40 percent, we call it as class four. So, class one bleeding is mild kind of a bleeding, whereas uh, uh, class two bleeding is moderate, and uh, and uh, class three is severe bleeding, and uh, more than uh, class four, more than 30 percent of bleeding is a very severe bleeding where. Uh, it is uh, life-threatening bleeding and the mortality is very, very high. So the clinical signs also will uh, differ from class to class. So we, uh, we, uh, this I will highlight in my subsequent slides. So bleeding areas you know, should be identified and it has to be addressed immediately. The bleeding can be in the brain for that, you know, the CT scan should be done. And the bleeding from the back is also one of the uh, area where it can uh, be missed. Okay, and so uh, proper log rolling should be done. If we have examined the abdomen, pelvis and long bones, there is no obvious bleeding. So think about bleeding from the back. Okay, and uh, uh, we at the same time when we are trying to check the bleeding from the back, the vertebral column can also be examined after log rolling, a possible fracture. Uh, 
of the vertebral column can be a possible uh, cause of sustained hypotension so patients who have uh, who have severe uh, hypotension which is not amenable not responding to fluids and requiring vasopressors and uh, these patients should be uh, considered to have a spinal cord injury and the treatment of the spinal cord injury is immediate fixation and immediate uh, uh, orthopedic intervention uh, uh, is very, very important. So once we have controlled the circulation, uh, uh, one more thing that I, I forgot to tell you is like, you know, if it is possible, UHG fast should be done in the same setting if we have a availability of the ultrasound. And in abdomen, we should screen for the four areas, right hypochondrium, left hypochondrium, uh, epigastrium to look for a pericardial tamponade and uh, the bleeding around the bladder or bladder injury uh, can be uh, can be examined with the help of ultrasound so ultrasound fast is one of the important tools uh, if it is available should be used while we are assessing the circulation